maybe just a couple words about the spawn day because there may be some companies here interested. We're, we're constantly looking, like MIT always does, we're always reinventing ourselves at MIT. There's not such thing as a, you know, as a way we do things. It's like we, we rethink everything every time we do anything. And, uh, but the spawn day is really important in that um, it, it really helps to, uh, not to people to focus their ideas, to kind of kick them up beyond the laboratory so they're ready for a startup. And, and I think uh, this is a place where we are uh, looking for models and new mechanisms to engage industry earlier and, uh, and, and, and partner. I mean, I think this is, partnerships are really what it's about. And in fact, as the company, I'm, gonna, I'm doing kind of a dual representation here today. I'm talking about some technology can on my laboratory in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, but this has uh, led to the founding of a company called C2Sense, which is a Desponde, you know, essentially spin out of MIT, which is led by Jan Schnorr, who will be doing the panel discussion here uh, later. Okay, so uh, our area of focus has really been around food and agriculture in C2Sense and also in my group. We, we were known really for doing kind of military type uh, sensors, explosives, chemical weapons, and uh, my wife got tired of that at cocktail parties and said, gee, can't you talk about something else other than bombs? And, <laughs> and so now I talk about food and, and you know, uh, flowers and plants. And uh, it, it actually, she likes that much better. Okay, so, but uh, our technology is one that we, we believe can be very much connected uh, into, you know, the, the, the internet of things, as people often talk about. We're looking for ways to... Uh, to do that, and we think we have a, a, a mechanism. Uh, and, and I think you can just look through here kind of the different types of, of application space, all the way from the field to in your house in a refrigerator. Imagine if your refrigerator could tell you when th what the status of everything was in the refrigerator and could just tell you, gee, you know, you better think about uh, making some guacamole. Those avocados are, are, are ripe, or uh, tonight might be a good night for uh, steak. Okay, because uh, we only have a few days left in that. So, uh, so we, could, we could think about things like that or just even personal devices. Okay? Uh, but one of the things that was mentioned earlier about this idea of food being uh, essentially uh, also important uh, worldwide to, uh, to, company, to countries that don't have enough food, to actually is geopolitical, and increasing our ability to, uh, to make and harvest more food is important. Let's see if I need to point this in a particular direction. Okay, so what we do in C2Sense and what we do in our lab, I mean, we're best known for gas sensors. We just tend to detect things in the gas phase, so you need to have volat volatiles. And uh, it was mentioned how flavor, I mean, a lot of flavor is smell, but food, there's lots of gases coming out of, of, of you know, everything around us. And so we, we're very interested in sensing gases, and, and uh, some key gases involved with food are our ethylene, which is a universal plant hormone, it controls, you know, uh, when things ripen, when flowers want to be pollinated. Um, it can be an indicator of when their plants are stressed. If you want to know when to to water your your crops or when to fertilize, uh, it can be basically a way of of monitoring with produce and plants all aspects of uh, of their. Uh, their status, and and particular, just shown here with a pear. How you can see when a pear ripens, it peaks in ethylene, and these these are very large changes that come out. This is how food. You've always heard it takes one bad apple, right? So when if you put a rotten apple in a crepe of nice apples, they all go rotten. Why is that? Well, there is ethylene gas being given off. Now, uh, amines are very important. Amines are my uh, decomposition products when things spoil. So that's very important for smart packaging. We'll talk about that. And then ammonia gas. Ammonium nitrate is a, you know, a very well-known fertilizer. So it's a, it's a way that we can get at you know, uh, how, how people can better use their fertilizing resources. Now the technology that we uh, work on is extremely simple. It's taking two electrodes and putting designer materials in between them that simply change their resistance, their electrical resistance, in response to a, a particular chemical. And where we're good at is making those really selective, okay, because selectivity is everything. If you have too much noise, you don't have enough, you don't have fidelity in your signal, and you don't have 
actionable information. Uh, the beautiful thing about doing just a simple electrical resistance measurement is it can be integrated in most anything. You can make, easily make arrays of things, of different, different things. The, you know, the semiconductor industry has taught us how to miniaturize devices like this. We can make them as small as we like. And um, they can also be very low power. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about the power, which is a lot of the cost here. So we don't have to have batteries on these sensors. They can be inductively powered uh, remotely. And ideally, they're going to cost so little that they can be integrated, maybe just printed on, on things that you uh, dispose of. Now, uh, the technology here that we, we began with was ethylene because it was so central. And the fact is, there, wasn't good solu there were not good solutions to ethylene sensing. And so we chose ethylene as kind of a, you know, a really, really uh, important target. And you can, you can get an idea that, you know, we're chemists and we're not afraid of making, this is a fairly sophisticated molecule that we, that we designed that essentially binds on a nanotube, carbon nanotube, to give us this selectivity, okay? And so we, we design materials, we know a lot about the organometallic chemistry of these that, that led to their response to ethylene. And uh, we just developed sensors that could essentially pick out ethylene signals out of a very complex background. So here's just showing you kind of some representative data on different ethylene sensors on, uh, sen uh, levels on some plants that were done in a laboratory, as you can see, with very sophisticated uh, things. Just took a, a, a funnel and stuck something to it. But this is some of Jan's innovation back when he was still a, a graduate student. Uh, but I think you know that if, you, if I were to put a banana and a pear up, you would smell, they wouldn't smell the same. You're not smelling differences in ethylene when you're smelling those. Your nose can't smell ethylene at that level. You're smelling other things. So what we can do is we, with this molecules like this, we can pick a small signal out of a very complex background. Now MIT also has many other uh, ways that we sponsor innovation. I mentioned that Jan actually led our Desponde project, but he also led a team in the MIT 100K competition and won a, uh, they won the Product Services Award um, two years ago? One, two, two years ago, two years ago. Okay, but anyway, it was a happy day. Okay, so, so anyway, so, so that's ethylene. We can do, ethylene's very, very important. We're working on it in all sorts of different ways. It's important with storage of, of fruit, with uh, managing greenhouses, causing things to synchronize and they're ripening. But also when food goes bad, you get microbial metabolites, which are called biogenic amines, which have a lot of the bad smell. And you might, you might guess that these two, putrescine and cadaverine, do not smell very well. Those are, those are actually uh, uh, amines that come out of these microbial decompositions, and uh, we can detect those pretty well. This is showing uh, a sensor that now responds in what we call a dosimeter fashion. So I showed you some data earlier where things went up and down with pulses. We have reversible sensors, but we can also make things that only respond in a dosimetric. That is, they give kind of an integration of the signal. And that that's, has some advantages. It can be very sensitive when you do it this way, and it can give you kind of uh, different information that you might want to, to act upon. And this is just showing some, some different uh, smells with uh, different sensing traces, which are very large signals that are irreversible uh, to these two analytes. And, um, my group is getting, we're, we're, it's kind of unusual, we're a chemistry building, chemistry lab, but we're constantly bringing in fruit and, and meat, and so we like, we like actually, we're dealing with real world things, so, so uh, this, this team that was led by Sophie Liu, who's presently still a graduate student, she went on to actually look at different uh, uh, decomposition of different, different, uh, different meats here uh, and, and fish. And, and showed that she could detect the differences and when they're nice and refrigerated, they don't give us these, these types of, of signals. And these are very large signals, but we, we get a transient here that it's, there are just some little, little things here in the, our sensing that we just put a delay. That's actually humidity response when you bring something up to the, the fish or not, but it's, it's something that's very easily dealt with. Uh, but anyway, we have sensors that can, can, can now detect the differences in you know, quality of, of meat. Now, I mentioned that the low power requirements of our sensors enable uh, them to be uh, very inexpensive and, and be made into sensors that you don't even need power sources on. I'm showing here a, a passive RFID chip, which works at 13.56 megahertz in your smartphones, 
that have a near-field communication device can, can interact with it. They can do digital communication up to about five centimeters. Now in this case, they're not only talking, this, this chip has no power source on it. It's being powered by the smartphone through digital uh, signals. It's being inductively powered and then the smartphone is talking back to it. There's a small microprocessor here that is, is, is enabling that uh, communication. You can store some data on it. You can do some other things. Uh, but what we've done in our lab is just uh, to simple, as a demonstration, is to simple hijack one of these things. We just cut the circuit here by just essentially taking a hole punch, and then we put in our sensor. And we do that, we can essentially take this, we can, we can make it to where it doesn't know it's been messed with, and then if we uh, give it a signal, it can change. Essentially, it can come out of resonance, can switch on and off, or we could have something that could turn on. Like you might, sometimes you might be looking for a signal and you want that to be the positive rather than the negative. And this is I'm just one slide. Yeah, so, so anyway, we have something that can essentially be a say yes, no, could be a stoplight, could be you know, red, yellow, green, tell you a very simple sensor. But I think you can see that this could be something that could be printed, it could be put into every package, uh, it could be part of smart packaging. This is an area that we're very interested in. So uh, just, uh, just to close here, I just want to mention we've talked about uh, sensors in, in agriculture. There's, you know, gas sensors are needed almost everywhere though. So there's a big area to, to go with, different, er different things we're interested in, lots of overlap with the agricultural space also. And with that, I'll take any questions if there's any time. Thank you. Any immediate questions for uh, Professor Swagger? So I see that we have made the move now from diets over to food, over to slowly <laughs> towards agriculture and gases. Uh, Cadavering. A little yeah. bit of a mix. <laughs> Cadavering. So you'll also can have a crack at Jan, who will be in the, uh, who's right, right there, who will be in the uh, other session. Right. So how did you get into this business of, of, uh, of food? Well, like I said, I just was looking for other big areas that, that needed sensors. And, uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the defense market is, is a tough one, right? The government's a horrible customer. Uh, and, um, and I was thinking, what would other be, where else would you need these things? And, and again, ethylene is a small molecule, seeming like a challenge. And it needs some organometallic chemistry. I thought I had some unique insights also. Yeah, so uh, you have your chance now. I'm going to take one more question as well, because Mr. Swagger is unfortunately not here for the panel. So yeah, this I'm, is your I am, chance. I am teaching. This is your <laughs> I do chance, have a day job. Folks. <laughs> is there a size limit on uh, the type of small molecule that you can detect? How big is too big? It's, it's really, oh, there's, it's, it's an interesting question, because bigger molecules are, tend to be less volatile. But bigger molecules, because they're less volatile, tend to be sticky. So if you can sample, so they're going to tend to give you irreversible responses that if you can sample long enough, you can get things. So, so I've done a lot in trace detection. Explosives tend to be very non-volatile. So it's really there about mass limits in detection. So as long as you have the time, okay, if you need to do something just immediately, it has to be really sensitive, right? But if you have time where you can do that kind of, you know, let it accumulate, you can detect things that are easily, you know, in explosives, we have sensors that are handheld that do, you know, parts per quadrillion, not parts per trillion, thousand times below that, right? You can do things like that with, with, with organic electronics. And so big molecules have advantages they can't, you know, sometimes it requires that they have a little time. But they have to fly or be aerostalized. Are looking at other gases like oh, no, sulfur. yeah, so no, we, we have a much broader agenda, which this, 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 in my lab, as well as in C2 sense, I mean, we do condensed phase sensing, water, we're working on actively in that, as many others. So we've, we've I, I, we counted up the other day, we've done about 80 different <coughs> analytes over time. So, so many different things. I just kind of focused on the kind of near term things that we're really actively pursuing here, but, but it's much broader, yes. <coughs> Last question. Okay. What is the range of distance from which you can detect and which you're targeting to detect? Yes, yeah, so I would say that, uh, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're looking at vapors, 
often you want to know, you know, there may be a room, you want to do the whole room. There, then, I mean, you're looking at a confined space and you're looking at average concentrations. But often when you're looking at distance, it's not a, neat, a, a trivial question because you have convection versus diffusion, right? So when you're in uncontrolled, you have uh, different currents in the room, air, air flow. So, you know, all I can give you, the, the best numbers I have is when we made explosive detectors, if you're perfectly downwind, sometimes it would, we could detect explo uh, bombs at, at 100 feet, or they, the Army can on their robotic platforms. That's, that's, that's really good, but that was like a good day, the wind blowing the right direction. So it's, so it's, a, hard, it's a hard question. I mean, it's going to be environmentally dependent. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you so much. Thank we appreciate you. this. I appreciate your time.